Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. We're talking with Pavel Stuglik. And uh, Pavel, welcome. Thank you so much. Super glad to be here. Where are you right today, right now? I'm in a big island in Hawaii. Oh, are you? Very interesting place to be, especially right now. Better the big island than Maui. But uh, Pavel is living an amazing life. By 21, his net worth was over $4 million. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's only 32 years old, but at 26, he already he morphed into another one of businesses. He owned seven regions for Orange Theory, which is a, a fitness franchise. And it, he had over, he had seven regions and a hundred franchises in that thing. And from all of these experiences, Pavel developed a uh, unique view and insight on life. And the interesting thing, Pavel, is that so many times, most of the time, leaders go through these things where they create success and maybe they don't really remember what they did that got them there because not everybody goes out there and does big things like you've had the opportunity to do. And then the other thing is a lot of times they're so busy doing those things and growing those enterprises they don't really have a lot of time to pass on those lessons to people coming up. And that can be one of the most rewarding things you can do is pass on these lessons and also a great learning thing because in a teacher a student situation is the teacher does the most learning. So it's a great way of expanding your own insights and all. So let's go right from the beginning You've got a complicated story, but some really legitimate achievements right out of the back. So let's talk about what got you started and in the whole entrepreneurial thing. And then we'll talk about how that led you into the carbon fiber operation. Yeah, thank you very much. And, you know, it's funny. These are some successes. But to be honest, the biggest lessons came from all of the losers, which I went through many times in my life as well. And as interesting as this life can be, just like many of us, you know, for me, it started off with being born and raised in Czech Republic and um, wanting to be a professional athlete. So I was driven by town cycling. What town in the Czech Republic? Liberec. It's a ah, town okay. north. <laughs> Have okay. you been? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. But that does give you a unique view of the world. And so you were fascinated or you got caught up in cycling and athletics. Yeah. And also, to be honest, America. So when I was 15 years old, I came to the States as a foreign exchange student to Brooksville, Florida. And uh, you know how they pick you, right? So you, you kind yeah. of go online and people pick you from different states. And at that time I was cycling and I was praying it's going to be one of those states that is warm because yeah. I needed to continue training in the winter. And yes, I got Florida, but I was totally on a farm. I was in Brooksville, Florida, which is in the middle of nowhere. And it was kind of ironic because I come from, you know, little town living in the middle of nature or in cabins. Yeah. And then I go straight to being on a cattle farm with the total, the same uh, landscape. <laughs> and as much as I would appreciate it today, you know, back then yeah. as a teenager, I definitely didn't. But uh, anyhow, that kind of taught me how to speak English. So that was amazing because I had this worldview of what is possible. And, you know, when I came back to Czech Republic, I basically was on this pivotal moment. You either go pro and you really put your all of your time and focus on on the sport or you go to school. And my dad literally gave me an option. Go to school. Life is paid for. Do your little cycling thing. And life is not paid for. And so being a young entrepreneur, I was only 17 years old. I was like, how am I going to fill the need on the market within the niche that I was in? And this is when, you know, Alibaba wasn't what it is today. People didn't trust it yet. This is like 14, 15, I don't even know, many years ago. And uh, basically, I found this little loophole. I took the picture from the Alibaba factory of a carbon frame or any sorts of, you know, carbon parts. And what would normally cost you, you know, four, $8,000 for a frame in the States, 
I could buy at five hundred thousand dollars, same quality, just why? Right, because you're buying it from Alibaba. Yeah, yeah. So I just went on on Alibaba. Yeah, because most people don't know the these pro level cycling bikes are usually carbon fiber, and the main part of the bike, the big expense is the frame. And so if you could get one of these eight thousand dollar frames for five hundred dollars or something or much less. That's a sweet spot. You're going to get a lot of interest. So you were pretty shrewd at 17. Yep. Yep. And, you know, and I was also thinking of myself, my friends. I mean, like, how do we get access to it? Because in Czech, you add $4,000 and it's like $20,000 in the States. And so uh, basically I put the picture on eBay and then on all of these other reselling platforms and I sold it on eBay or these platforms. And then I shipped it directly from China to the end user. Now, How much did it cost? (laughs) Zero. I made the person that is paying for it pay for the order and shipped it directly to them. So that's how, you know. You had to get tricky. You had to get pretty clever on the timing of your billing. The finance is coming in and then the finance is going out. You had to be really be on top of your game. Otherwise, the lag time on deliveries would be not good. So. Yeah, no. So what's good is like, so I would put on eBay, you know, seven to 10 day delivery, which DHL with China, I mean, it delivers really quickly. So I had a buffer and then I used that money that they paid me to basically submit the order and pay for it. Essentially, you know, later on, I did become professional cyclist. And what I did is I used all of the different cities that we went into to race. I would start talking to the local bike stores and local part dealers. And basically I would be like, hey, you can sell branded product for X, or you can have a subdivision that's half the cost and you can have your logo on it on top. So I got into this custom basically built carbon frame and then later on, I mean, it, it exploded. It I started going to China. I was operating out of Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and Taiwan. What do you mean you were operating out of there? Meaning I built the relationship with the factories. Ah. And, you know, especially in China, right? If you have a in-person meetings, your pricing gets totally different. And they're very you much... You made a trip over there to meet. You bought so many of these things. You said, I'm going to go meet them. Is that yep. what, you, what was your thought process on that? So I wanted to meet them to get a better deal, better structure, not have to have so many units to customize certain orders. Uh, So it was kind of like, how do we make a long-term partnership? And then I also start going to the conferences. So there's all of these biking shows or just like real estate has its conferences. The same thing goes for the... In Europe, these conferences, Europe or United States, where? Around the world? So the Taiwan primarily, uh, as well as... Yep, yep. And the last two years of my cycling career, I actually raced for Chinese team. So, and, and we were based what? in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up doing all of these tours, you know, literally all around the world. I raced the whole Southeast Asia, Asia, South America, you know, America, Europe. And so throughout the year, I had this amazing way to travel at cost from the team while I'm building my business. So they really have all these bike tours, cycling tours all throughout Asia. It's oh, it's a sport, you know, in America, it's not as big, especially after Lance Armstrong did a really good PR campaign for it. (laughs) But uh, essentially in Europe, I mean, some countries, it's a national sport like Holland, Belgium. I mean, Italy, it's massive. It's huge. (laughs) Wow. So you were getting an education, but you every time you learn about a new area or whatever, your mind would start. How can I expand my business off of this? Right. Absolutely. But, you know, let me tell you, the hard truth is that I wasn't recovering. So when you're a cyclist, I mean, you're racing 20, 25,000 miles a year on a bike. Sometimes you do two week long tours where, you know, it could be two, 3000 kilometers. So like 1600 miles. And basically what started happening, my body completely shut down and I got a chronic fatigue. I got an Epstein-Barr and I got awfully sick into a point where, you know, I had to quit cycling and it destroyed me. I went into depression. I wanted to do Tour de France. I had a suicidal thoughts because, you know, you've got this personality, right, that you're building around your your future visions that was completely squashed by my health. And so this has kind of been the first pivotal moment that led me into health and biohacking and, you know, all of these personalized health optimization because I had to heal myself because I couldn't function anymore. That's when I moved to America. 
basically right after I ended cycling, it was a solid. Well, this, let's just talk about that before. How did that evolve? I mean, you get the uh, Epstein Barr syndrome. Now, where were you? And then how did that, how quickly did your world crumble? And how old were you? So I believe the first time I was about 18 years old. Yeah, about 18, 19 years old when I got diagnosed. And I have a crazy story. I was in the States and I literally, I had a car in Athens, Georgia. I had a, all really? of my gear in, really? uh, yep. In Athens, that's where my office, my one of my offices is in Athens. Yeah. No way. Yeah. So we yeah. used to train the six gaps up in the Dahlonega. And, oh, uh, really? Oh, yeah. Really? So because it's amazing there when you need to train on the East Coast. Sure, sure. I had uh, bikes ready for a tour in Oregon. I was getting out of a team training in Texas and all of a sudden my visa doesn't go through and I get dispatched without any prejudice. So they gave me no reason why not. So at that time I was racing for a US American team and basically had to leave the country. This is when I got really dark because at the same time I got diagnosed with all of this. And I remember I went back to check and I was like, what am I going to do? And so I decided to go to Thailand for a month just to recharge, regroup and figure out what's next. And then this Chinese team. Let me ask uh, you about that. Let me ask you about that. You're how you're like 20, 21 now. Is that this was still around 19, 1920. So I quit cycling right around 20, 21 years old. For those of you who are sick and tired of fooling around and are dead serious about wanting to move up fast, I've got something especially for you. I've combined the best insights from over 40 years in business and making $70 million in income and compressed them into a free webinar. That's right. It's a free resource. If you want to find out exactly what the concepts are that I use in coaching million dollar earners, register now at widelonwinning.com you'll discover the five-part framework used by so many to reach their financial, personal, and professional goals. You can find that link in this episode's show notes. So did you, you go back to check, who could you talk to to kind of work this out? Because you were living a very unique, I mean, you had a -a one-of-a-kind type life plus operation. You had all of these business tie-ins. So you had a lot of plates spinning, let's just say like that. And then out of this, now the whole fundamental thing of you being a athlete disappears. So, and you're trying to decide the future, what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Who do you talk to? Who did you talk to? Who was there? Yeah, you know, I think my parents, because they ended up coming with me to Thailand and we kind of reconnected as a family. But ironically, with me losing this, I ended up getting called by this, you know, huge professional team, which was funded by China, but stationed in Holland Uh and Europe. And so I'm a month off. And towards the end of that month, I get a call that they got a bunch of injuries in a team. They need somebody to help and replace them for the end of the year. And so I've done enough results at that point from the States that like I would be able to, you know, get on this team. So I literally flew back from Thailand, got on the car, drove up to Germany. And then all of a sudden, you know, a week later, I'm racing with the biggest guys in the industry. And it was so crazy because I was, first of all, still so young. But second of all, I am watching these people on a TV, you know, last week. And then I'm racing with these people next week on with the world champions and Olympic winners. I was just like, I know you, I know you, I know you. And then what am I doing here? (laughs) It was an amazing dream. So now all of a sudden the athletic career is back on the table as a possibility. So I went back and basically for the next year and a half, two years, I found like a medium line where I would do races and then take time off, do races, take time off. But it got so bad that basically, you know, I had to quit. It was over. And um, the recovery, the recoveries were not working the way they needed to. You could see the handwriting on the wall that this was not going to work. It's yeah, it's a shame there wasn't a medical solution out there and that would allow you or somebody who knew something that could get you around there. But you've got to live your life. You can't, you're faced with choices. You've got to keep moving. So what did you do? 
Yeah, so true. You know, and now it's funny when I look back, I wish I knew all these biohacks, you know, for right. recovery, for yeah. like, I'm like, oh my right. gosh, like I literally have the pathway to success. But absolutely. But, you know, to be honest, like I've always struggled with purpose, even during cycling, even though it was awesome, even though it was this like idealistic vision. But then when I became pro, it was about branding. It was about being on a TV. It was about it lost the love for the sport that I had and also for the freedom. You know, there's something freeing when you're just on the bike and constantly in the nature and there's no thoughts. It's just you and the bike and Mother Earth. And so... What happened to me, I was like, this kind of feels like a modern gladiatorship, you know, for any sports. People get really, really excited when you crash and when you fall and then people get, you know what I mean? And I'm like, for freaking what? (laughs) Damaging my body and damaging my life, my future, you know, longevity. So it was a good time that like ultimately everything happens for the greater reason. So I moved to US and I had to figure out the visa situation. And so the only pathway at that time was E2 visa, which is investment visa that you can get. And basically I went on a biz buy sell and I started looking for small businesses that I could inquire to be able to start a new life. So you moved to the United States. Where did you, you know, the one thing that I'm hearing about your, uh, that was in your favor, that you were able to get near the top of the activity, you know, that you were most excited about and compete at that level, meet the top people. You got a taste, a real solid taste of what that was like, even though you weren't able to continue on and make it a a career. But it makes it easier, I would imagine, to leave that behind if you have to and go on to another direction once you've seen what it is rather than never, you know, always unfulfilled, unsatisfied. And so at least you had that in your favor, you know, you got to at least taste it. Well, and honestly, also the business side of me, like at least I had something to lean on to because, you know, most athletes, when they quit, I mean, they fall into depression and they don't know what to do, right? Like if all you know is to train and work hard and then, you know, you put these guys, even though they have an amazing mind and endurance, it's like, you know, what do you do with your life? And so for me, it kind of, when I moved to the States, I ended up finding a sushi restaurant in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, (laughs) and the reason why, you know, Boulder is an amazing amazing training place where we would do high altitude training. And so I was like, okay, at least I can like stay in the nature and I can figure out a way forward. But three months later, it did not qualify again. And, you know, in the restaurant industry, nobody shows profits. And for the customs, you have to show a certain amount of profits. You have to certain amount of employees. And there's all these criteria that you have to meet. And restaurant business, they will show you minus as much as possible <laughs> or negative. And so essentially, I was screwed again. I went on a hunt. So you were in this, you had a sushi business. Is that what you're saying? And so that yeah. was, you bought a sushi business. And you were running, and but it, there was not enough profits for you Correct. to buy your visa and staying on longer because the government yep. looked at that as a phony business. And so <laughs> now you got another dilemma. How quick did you realize there's not going to be enough money out of so- this? So there was enough money when you look at the numbers from the owner side, but there was not enough money when it comes to the institutions. And and so basically, you know, in my eyes, it was perfect. But unfortunately, those were not the eyes I had to be looking through. But anyway, so I was there about three months and I was starting to do renovations and I had a whole idea how to make it really funky. And it was in a college town. So it was very much speaking to that crowd. So then I went on a hunt again to look for more stuff. And basically I found Tutti Frutti frozen yogurt chain in Hawaii. I don't know if you remember the frozen yogurt era, like uh, it was, it exploded everywhere. So that ended up qualifying and I ended up moving to Hawaii. Where do you evaluate these? But you said you started looking at more businesses. Where were you looking? I mean, there had to be, where do you look for these kind of businesses? So, you know, back then, just biz buy sell, it was already listed. I mean, now, you know, I'll be like, whatever's listed is too late, different mindset. But at that point, I kind of looked at it like, okay, this is what it does right now. If I make improvements, this is what it hopefully can do. And so I was kind of looking for businesses that had a potential to scale. 
And uh, this business, you know, it was the territory of Hawaii. So there was a potential to open more locations. There were already, I think, six or seven at that time. And then I also started distributing the actual product to the other stores on the market that would have been our competitors. So I ended up making it fine, just okay. Did you go back to Thailand and pick up your parents and bring them to Hawaii? (laughs) They did. They ended up moving to Hawaii. They were. And ironically, so my father ended up running it after when I left because wow. they, so we all needed to have a visa, you know, at that point. So right. we were able to figure out a solution how to all of us move there. Yeah. But I got sick and tired of making people fat. And, yeah. you know, at that point, I already knew all of these health, what's healthy and what's not. And when you look at what's in the powder, what makes the yogurt, like, oh my gosh, I don't want (laughs) to make your next trip to the yogurt place (laughs) bad. Gary Seinfeld had a uh, episode one time about that somebody opened up a fat-free yogurt, sugar-free yogurt store down the uh, street. And they were all always in there eating the yogurts. It just everything was eating the yogurt. And they started all getting fat. He said, where are we getting? How can we get fat, sugar free, fat free? And we're getting fat. So there's something else in there that's not doing you any good. Well, I have a lot to say about it because, I mean, the whole calories are hoax. I mean, if you get on a healthy, pure fat diet, you know, grass-fed butter, right. MCT oil, you will actually lose weight, even though you yeah. might have four, 6,000 calories of it. So that's a different conversation. You've, on the... <laughs> you've done some work with people that are really made a big deal out of that, haven't you, with uh, Dave Asprey and all that? Yeah. 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 That was my doorway into this world. But yeah. So when I got tired of this, I was like, I got to go. I left the islands and I moved. How long uh, was this now? How long were you there? I was about 21 years old, 22, 22 years old when I left there. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealanwinning.com. Thanks for listening.